Felix here. My advisor just asked me, what are the top stocks you're looking at right now? And I said to her, Tiger Lily, I think that's a great question. Let us do a video on that. Share the research with everybody. Not just give you the names, but actually explain to you the process and the hows and the whys. And some of these are stocks you know, and some of these are stocks you've probably never heard of or certainly never looked at. And I hope it will give you some ideas for research and digging and wealth accumulation, which is what this is all about. To make sure you get the most value out of this, I'm also giving you a monster document with all the research and the moats of the top 25 companies out there to really understand what makes companies special. Read this. Go to felixfriends.org slash moat, M-O-A-T, and you will be the smartest person in the room. Well, unless a cat's present, in which case you're obviously not. Right, then let's get cracking. Stock numero uno is AutoZone. And you might have seen them if you live in the US. What do they do? Well, let's look, let's look at the numbers. Cash flow is meh, growing not that much. Stock price has gone up quite a lot. That's not brilliant. But look at the profit. Cha-ching. And a D for relative value is not a terrible grade because there is E and there is F. And something with a very high profit health typically has an E or an F. So I'm actually very happy with that. So what do they actually do? This is a screenshot from a Twitter account called Moat Data. Give the guys a follow. They do a tremendous job. They put this out. And they're basically saying it has five moats. It has brand recognition moat because people trust it. People like it. And by people, I mean both mechanics and sort of do-it-yourself enthusiasts who like fixing up their cars. It has massive scale through distribution, enormous product selection, and um, decent tech, data analytics, and so on to improve inventory management and everything else. So that's a good thing. And you now know what they do. They do automotive replacement parts and, and sort of accessories and bits. And look at the gross margin. 53%. Now, it's not a tech stock where you might get 70 or 80. It's a real world company. But for a real world company selling hardware, that's pretty, pretty good stuff. Revenue at 17 billion growing very nicely. Net income, that's real profit at 2.6 billion is pretty impressive. I haven't got an ROIC number for some reason, but I do have a long term profit growth number, which is 14%, which is quite impressive. Let me see if these guys had an ROIC number. Yeah, they do. And it's 55%. Wow. Return on invested capital is 55%. That makes that a tremendously high quality business, 55%. And my rule of thumb is always take ROIC, take earnings growth, and that gives you roughly by how much the stock should go up by per year. Now, it doesn't obviously happen linearly like that, but that's that's kind of the idea with it. So very, very impressive. Do they have free cash flow? Oh boy, they have free cash flow. $2 billion, which is pretty impressive. They do have a fair bit of debt, 12 billion, but they're still managing to pump out free cash flow despite all the financing that they've got there. And that's just because the company actually generates very, very nice cash flow from operations. So they can afford the debt that they've got. And management, it consistently beats by a pretty wide margin what analysts are expecting them to do. So they're not just guys covered in grease. They actually know what they're doing. They run a very, very tight ship there. So that's pretty impressive. And is it expensive? Probably not by the metrics we normally look at, 20x forward PE. <clears throat> if you held on to that for nine or 10 years and you thought that they were going to grow in the sort of low teens in terms of year-on-year -year profit growth, then you get it at 7.6x by 2033. So it's a patient gain, isn't it? And patience is really what's required if you want to make money in the long run with good stocks. Now, what about this one here? You've heard of this one, isn't it? Is this something you squeak most mornings? I, I've got some American acquaintances here in Hong Kong where I'm right now, and they get into a car in the morning and they will drive to a Starbucks to buy themselves a coffee. And I said to them, 
you, you can afford a coffee machine, can't you? And they were like, yes. And I said, you've got housekeepers. They could make you a decent cup. And they just, I don't, it's a thing. It's just a thing. It's an American thing. I don't understand it, honestly. I would rather buy the bloody machine and do it at home if I wanted to. But let's just look at what they're doing. Cash flow so-so, growing very nicely. Stock price not doing very well. We love that. And it's insanely profitable, not particularly expensive. So Starbucks looking quite interesting. Now, what's the mode of Starbucks here? A lot of it is honestly just brand. I was just in South Korea last couple of days, Seoul. All the South Korean kids run around with Starbucks. Every tourist holds a Starbucks. It seems that you are not a complete human being unless you're holding a plastic cup or something with a Starbucks logo on it. And yes, they have stores everywhere, location. Uh, they obviously have a very good supply chain. The customer loyalty program is insane because you're prepaying for coffee and there's value on that. So the company gets the cash up front. It's just like people must really like coffee. It's, 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 it's an addictive product, isn't it? And just, yeah, global presence, the whole thing, the whole cult thing that they've got going on, that's very, very hard to build out. So very impressive from a brand point of view. And I think you know what they do. They sell coffee. Now, gross profit margin isn't massive because it's a relatively low ticket item that they sell, but they have 36 billion revenue growing pretty nicely. 4 billion of that is profit. Long-term earnings growth at 16% is pretty impressive. Again, I've got no return on invested capital number. Why is that? Why is that? Okay, we haven't got one. If I'll find it, I'll, I'll pop it down below in the in the description. And uh, so, uh, good numbers, good numbers. And free cash flow is staggeringly wonderful. 4.3 billion this year. So it goes up and up and up and it allows them to do buybacks or dividends or whatever else they want to do. They certainly don't need money. That's a good thing. Now, they've had a, been a bit choppy with last quarter earnings. And I think that's why the stock's a little bit under pressure here. We did the same thing in Q1 2023 and, and also again in 2022. So there's a little bit of that fluctuation and potentially we can use that to time an entry when the stock's been beaten up just a little bit. And then just sit there and wait for people to drink that addictive stuff because right now it's trading at 21 times PE. In nine years, that'll be 4X, 5X PE. And how does that work? Well, PE is, is what? Price. Price. And then earnings is profit, right? So what happens? Price stays fixed and profit goes up. So your PE ratio changes, provided you were to buy the stock at today's share price. I'm not telling you you should do that. You're taking advice from my cat, right? Remember. Now, what about the next one here? It's Apple. Oh my God, but I thought Apple is dying. I thought it's the end of the business. And okay, let's take, take a step back from the ledge there. Uh, and growth is, growth is not great, but it's insanely profitable. The stock's under pressure, which we love. It's good, good cash flow, and it's not particularly expensive. And little moat summary again from our Twitter friends. And it has one of the strongest moats out there. Customer loyalty is insane. It's, it's like a religion. It's a cult. It's absolutely fantastic. All their products only work together with other Apple products. They're completely incompatible, more or less, with other things out there. So the ecosystem lock-in is a big thing. Very, very good with their supply chain, obviously. And R&D and innovation, I think that's a little bit where they've been faltering slightly, but people will just buy this new iPhone if it has a slightly better camera than the last one. I mean, they'll sleep on the street in a tent to get their hands on it. And that shows you it's an amazing brand, amazing global positioning and everything else. And, and so, yeah, we basically know what they do. And I know they're not selling that many. The growth of iPhones isn't growing that much. But there are 1.3 billion iPhones out there in use, in use. So what does that mean? That gives you a huge marketplace that pretty much only Apple has access to, although the European Union is trying to do something about that. And they can sell them software, other services, banking, whatever else. And, you know, they're trying a few different things. Uh, advertising, I think, is going to be a big one there. Like, you know, Amazon brings in 80 billion in advertising more than more than YouTube does. So 
I think there's a lot of opportunities there for them. I, I would like to see them roll out a few more things a little bit more fast, but it'll happen. It's got an incredibly strong foundation. Gross profit margin at 45%. Yeah, very high marketing cost, um, high production cost, but revenue is 385 billion. And of that, more than a quarter, a hundred billion is net profit. This is not a dying business, folks. It's just a business that's growing a little bit more slowly. It's maturing. Return on invested capital at 57%. It's like, like I said the other day, you know, the Colombian drug lords are like, what? That's their margin? Let's put everything into Apple stock, shall we? Because it's going to be an easier business. And profit's still growing at 10% a year in the longer term. Still pretty, pretty good stuff there. And look at the free cash flow, $106 billion. So, you know, buybacks. They can buy back lots and lots of their own shares uh, and therefore are going to do pretty tremendously well. And they are beating market expectations pretty much all the time. There was one quarter last year where they weren't, but other than that, they're doing a very, very good job. I would just like to see a little bit more innovation, a little bit more risk going on over there with that much money, uh, or, or just gobble up some startups and let them do their thing and then brand it under Apple. I think that'd be a nice thing to do. 25 times PE, is it cheap? Nah, not cheap, but if you think it's going to grow sort of in the 10% range, and you hold on to this thing for eight years, you get it at 13x, which is not bad over halving over, over eight years or so. What about this one here? Have you heard about this one? Island Builds Biggest Holding. It's got tremendous growth, pretty good cash flow. Stock price has gone up a bit, so not amazing, but profit, oh good God, and it's not expensive. And Microsoft, in terms of moat, it's, yeah, I think network effect is the best way to describe it. And that's one of the, the most powerful moats. The more people use the product, the more people can't switch out of it. You work in a company, everybody uses Microsoft products. You can't just not do it. And that's just where they are. Right? I'm using a Windows computer. It's got Microsoft 365 on it. Do I think it's a great product? No, but it's what's available. It's what's accessible. When I buy a computer, I know how to use it. I'll keep using it. And they're doing the same thing with, with the AI offering, cloud services and everything else. And the switching cost is significant. I would not switch to a, an Apple because I do not want to lose days of my life trying to learn something that basically does the same thing. And I know some Apple Arati will go, no, it's amazing. I'm sure it's amazing. But Ultimately, is it going to change my output? Probably not, right? What do I do? I research things. I I, I use trading softwares. I, I make videos and, you know, um, send emails and use Slack. And that's pretty much it. And the scale of their network and their sales system is unparalleled in software. Nobody can sell better than Microsoft, in my views. And they've been innovating or stealing or acquiring or whatever else. And they're always there at the top. I mean, they basically own the AI space. So very, very impressive management. And they do everything very, very well. And look at the gross profit margin, 69%. You know, our poor drug lords are again going, okay. Um, insane. 82 billion profit on 227 billion revenue. It's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's really like... If you're watching this, you know, lovely drug lords, just buy Microsoft chess and go and retire. Seriously, it's a better investment. Return on invested capital, 28%. Growth rate, 17% on profit. So I would always look at that and go, I think the stock should go up 70 to 28%. That's not financial advice. That's just my, my rule of thumb for, for the long run. And boy, do they have free cash flow, 67 billion. So buybacks, dividends, the whole shebang. They can acquire whatever technology and startup and, you know, Sam Altman and, 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 and any, any other siblings he may have and, and, and put them in a dungeon and, and let them do their thing because they just have money. And they beat market expectations all the freaking time. Very, very good management. Just It's just a machine. What about this one? Visa. What about Visa? You know, the plastic that apparently is going to go out of business. No one's going to use credit cards anymore. No, everyone's going to use phones and 
when you pay with your phone, what do you use? I've got my credit card on my phone. Still goes for the credit card. So no, online shopping is bigger than ever. People are paying more things with cards because cash is going out of fashion. And it's probably going to get banned at some point. European Union is already making steps in that direction. I think if you send somebody more than 3,000 euros now in Europe, you need to like provide reasons for it or something like that. It's like insane. And I think you're not allowed to pay things over 3,000 euros in cash. It's actually illegal. So it's brilliant for people like Visa, right? And cash flow is insane. It's growing monstrously. Price has actually gone down, which we love, and it's insanely profitable. It's not particularly expensive. So we love Visa. And what's the what's the moat? What's the the alligator? It's again network effect. Nobody has a payment network. Nobody has a card, a payment service as as widely accepted around the world as Visa. I mean. I travel absolutely everywhere, all sorts of countries and little tin pot huts. And can I pay with something? Yeah, the one thing that I accept is Visa card, right? So it's an insane. Brand recognition is massive. The regulation and the environment is so incredibly expensive. And I'm sure Visa is lobbying every year for more and more regulation in all the major countries in the world. Because when you are the big ape in the in, in the jungle, then you want lots of regulation. It makes it harder for other people to get in. So they love that. And yeah, technology is, is crazy. Tokenization and everything else, fraud prevention, insane partnerships, and nobody has the scale that Visa has, basically. It's incredibly hard to replicate, incredibly expensive to replicate. And this is gross profit margin is moat, right? That tells you how many alligators are swimming around the castle, and it's 97.8% gross profit margin. That's almost 100% gross profit margin. What they bring in, it's just pure gross profit. Um, honestly, if you're an arms dealer or drug trafficker, just buy Visa stock. It'll You'll just sleep better at night, and you'll probably make more money. It'll be a lot, lot easier. Revenue, 33 billion, of which more than half, more than half, is net profit. Return on invested capital at 30% is gloriously wonderful. Earnings, profits growing 13% a year. So just an extraordinary business. Free cash flow, 19 billion. So they're bringing more free cash than profit. Why? People pay up front. Right? It's just crazy. It's just, it's crazy business. It's, I mean, if there's one business I could own, I think it quite possibly would just be Visa. MasterCard is similarly very, very good, by the way. Very similar numbers. And what can I say? Everything is green, right? It's just beat, 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 beat all around every single quarter. So just a glorious business. Now, what about this one here? Oh, this is exciting. Waste management. Finally, finally, the growth stock that I've always wanted to talk about. And they've got nah, free cash flow. It's not growing that much. Price hasn't gone up a lot. It's pretty profitable. And it looks expensive. So why are you showing us this, Felix? What's with this duff stock here? But well, let's look at this. What do they do? Well, waste management. And of course, you might think of, you know, the Sopranos or something. But uh, it's, in all seriousness, a pretty regulated envi uh, environment for environmental reason. Um, you need to spend a lot of money on landfills and recycling facilities and buy trucks and everything else. It's a hard thing to do. It's an expensive thing to get into. And the larger you are, the more waste you handle, the cheaper it is to handle each pound of waste. And then you need to have reach by area, customer relationships with cities and businesses and factories and so on. So they've got a pretty, pretty sweet setup there in that sense. And that's exactly, of course, what they do is environmental solutions, basically to handle your rubbish. Gross profit margin, yeah, 38%. Well, it's waste. It's not gold, right? It's not it's okay. Revenue, 20 billion, of which about 12% is, is, is net income, profit. But your return on invested capital is pretty extraordinary and earnings growth is pretty extraordinary here, which means it makes it a potentially nice diversification stock because you're not going to produce more or less waste just because 
Microsoft goes up or down or the AI bubble bursts or something. So it's just sort of like a the anti-tech stock. It's the opposite of everything else we ever look at. And I think sometimes that's a good thing to look at just to provide some balance in a, in a portfolio. Do they have free cash flow? <laughs> yeah, $1.8 billion, which is pretty staggering. So they've got money. They're clearly well run. They are beating earnings with pretty high consistency. So they are, seem to have capable management there. And waste isn't cheap. 30 times PE. But as long as they keep growing, that sort of 10% growth level, that does probably go down to about 10x or so within 10 years. So you get rewarded for holding for a long period of time, provided they're still around. There we are, folks. Get your hands on the research and on the 25-page document that I have that really explains what moats are. If you want to become a great investor, you need to be able to identify moats. This will do the job for you. So download it. It's free of charge. I want to make you into a better investor, more successful investor. Get to your financial freedom. Head over to felixfriends.org slash moat, M-O-A-T, and download it. If you enjoyed this video, share it with somebody, encourage them to watch and download the same research. And I thank you for tuning in. I thank you for watching. Winston and Felix here. And Winston just said to me, Felix, it's almost April. What stocks are we buying in April? And I thought, Winston, that's a genius idea.